Hello. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, I'd like to especially thank Ariel Heminger for being incredibly helpful throughout this process, as well as throughout the conference that this is the keynote to. Uh, I'd also like to, in particular, shout out both Connor Brown and Ben Miller for stepping up to be the program's chairs and making sure that this conference could go off without a hitch. I was really excited to catch some of the talks earlier, and it was thanks to their dedication that we were able to pull this together. Uh, I'd like to also thank the entire GPSS executive board, including Alice Fox, Anusha Prasad, Amanda Burrows, Emily Burns, and especially Kayla Allward, who filled in a much needed gap when we were in crisis during this semester and trying to finish up a living wage campaign. And she really stepped up to make sure that was possible. Um, all, everybody on the team is brilliant. I can't thank them enough for all their hard work. Uh, and I'm really excited to honor them with this strong keynote. Uh, we've had a doozy of a year this year. Uh, most of you probably know this, but when we began in fall, we put forward 25 different changes to make the university a more equitable, just, and supportive environment for the most vulnerable members of our community, including but not limited to graduate students. We really want to take a holistic approach. Today, I'm really pleased to report that despite objections to our methods and outcries of us being too mean or too pushy, uh, we have won over half of those 25 recommendations. Um, including most recently and perhaps most excitingly, on Monday, we won the task force for a living stipend for graduate students. Supportive environment. Oh, you might want to mute the YouTube link, Stephen, because it comes through on the mic. Apologies. Yeah, no I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Uh, but we won this living stipend in no small part because of graduate students, like many in the audience, as well as allies throughout the university who helped us challenge the anti democratic leadership uh, at this university. So during these last nine months or so, we faced significant hardship, uh, mostly because we didn't shy away from addressing controversial yet absolutely vital topics for uh, our university environment. And on that note, and at risk of putting myself into even more hot water, uh, I'm about to give a controversial statement, which is to say, I want to publicly condemn the transphobic statements made by a Virginia Tech swimmer um, in their official statement a couple days ago towards Leah Thomas. Uh, I mention this because we shouldn't be afraid to challenge injustices, even when it's a hot button issue or controversial or not relevant to the talk at hand. Um, we owe it to one another to fight for a better world for everybody. And you can't compromise on justice without compromising justice itself. And we strongly condemn all transphobia and believe that trans women have just as right, a much right to sport as anybody else. In any case, several of our proposed changes, which were adopted by the Senate by a wide margin, uh, garnered outrage by uh, certain members of our community, both inside our community and also outside of it. In particular, the boycott, divest, sanction work we did got my team and I 10 weeks of targeted harassment by both Hillel at Virginia Tech, random APAC-funded news outlets, and I use news and scare quotes there, uh, and even the state government who tried to pass a law specifically targeting us. My team was sent sexist, racist, xenophobic harassment, and I, a Jew, was sent Holocaust imagery and anti-Semitic threats of violence in the very name of combating anti-Semitism. We were sent this shit every day for those 10 weeks, and I was getting pictures of children dying in the Holocaust from Zionists, even while my bubby was dying in the hospital. So thanks for that. Uh, and if you associate with any of those groups uh, or any of those hateful ideologies, then all I ask is you consider why that behavior was unchallenged and unquestioned within those communities, or even by the university who still has yet to release any sort of support for us officially. As testimony from Palestinian activists and human rights reports and more human rights reports make clear, those who challenge Israel's apartheid state are on the right side of history. And I wanna make it clear that the last harassment campaign did not work. Uh, the harassment campaign that tried to stop us from bringing Stephen to speak today also did not work, obviously that the attempts to shut down our criticisms of Israel did not work. And even the state laws, which were introduced into committee to challenge my team, did not work. And I wanna shout out the Virginia Coalition on Human Rights for helping us fight that, as well as a ton of other groups who helped us absolutely crush that state legislation. So with that out of the way, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce scholar, activist, all around badass, Stephen Slater to talk to us today about reward and punishment in the corporate university. Stephen is the author of no less than eight well-reviewed books on anti-Arab racism and the occupation of Palestine. Uh, putting on my political theorist hat for a moment, I'm sort of geeking out a little bit because I'm a big fan. It's such good work, y'all. Uh, highly recommend you check it out after this talk. 
Stephen is also notable for being a former Virginia Tech professor who faced huge amounts of harassment from both within and without the university for taking a principled committed stance against imperialism, even when it meant critiquing uh, the US military, which on Virginia Tech's campus in particular is a big no-no for some people. It is the sharp moral clarity that he brings to us today. Stephen stands in for a model for why it is important to do the right thing even when you face enormous consequences. consequences which is the kind of moral courage that I think we all need to learn a little bit from today and in the future. So with that, uh, that concludes my remarks and I'd like to welcome Stephen here for the keynote and take it away. Will do, thank you. And I'm, I'm going to trust that uh, somebody in the audience will let me know if, if there's some, some technical problem to add a little bit of um, spice to the evening. <laughs> My internet connection all afternoon has been going in and out, so I'm praying that it holds for you know the next uh, hour or so. Uh, before I get started, I, I've prepared some comments. I, I, I normally like, uh, especially at, o over Zoom, to to speak off the cuff, and as you can probably tell already, that that's not always a good thing for the audience. So I prepared some comments. Um, they should take about. 40 minutes, um, give or take. Happy to engage with you for any questions that you might have at the end of it. But first, let me let me thank um, all of the, the graduate students at Virginia Tech for inviting me. I'm just tremendously honored to be here and, and to be with you all. Been following your work um, with, with much happiness and gratitude. Um, Jack Leff and Ariel Heminger particularly have, have been super helpful and, and have helped me with the technological aspect of this presentation, which is, is not as easy as it, as it might sound. Um, I know that there's at least uh, one person tuning in um, from, from Palestine. So uh, you know, shout out to DS in, in Palestine if you're still here. I'm going to go ahead and and get started, and uh, I, I'm happy to address what or clarify, um, you know, some of my comments, uh, address your questions, um, whatever at the 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 end of this. Let me start by mapping out my relationship with Virginia Tech. My brother went to Virginia Tech. My sister went to Virginia Tech. My father went to Virginia Tech. My father's brother went to Virginia Tech. My two brothers-in-law went to Virginia Tech. My sister-in-law went to Virginia Tech. Much of my high school class went to Virginia Tech. I grew up an hour west of here in a border town called Bluefield and spent what must have been a hundred weekend days in Blacksburg. And I taught for nine years at Virginia Tech. My relationship with the university ended poorly. I came to Virginia Tech as an assistant professor in 2006. Three years later, I earned tenure. In 2013, I accepted another job at the University of Illinois with no effort on Virginia Tech's part to retain me. A few days before reporting in the fall of 2014, I was fired from Illinois tenure and all, leaving me in a damnable no man's land. Nevertheless, a return to Virginia Tech was out of the question. I had already resigned. Besides, nobody at the school offered it as a possibility. Well, why did the relationship end poorly? I hope you'll forgive my bias, but it wasn't because I had done anything wrong. I had an excellent research profile, much stronger if I can be allowed a bit of self-congratulation than my college and department colleagues. I was a popular teacher. I never fielded a student complaint. My mere presence boosted the university's interminable and ineffectual diversity efforts. And I certainly upheld the principles of community so proudly touted around these parts as some kind of ethical cure-all. More on those later. What got me in trouble was an essay. To be more specific, an essay questioning the wisdom of compulsive patriotism. An essay, in other words, asking readers to think critically about grandiloquent narratives of self and society, precisely the sort of thing a humanities professor is supposed to do. An essay that all in all is rather conservative in its outlook, not to mention its assumptions, and one whose conclusions I no longer fully agree with. 
The essay was published in Salon.com on a Sunday. I'll always remember it was a Sunday because we usually treated ourselves to pizza on Sunday and I was too nervous to eat. A few hours after the essay posted, it was burning through the internet. By Monday, various people on campus were calling for me to be fired. My aggression against the poor beleaguered military had made national news. Fox News cranked up its usual bluster. Every boot litter with an internet connection was shocked and offended. The White House issued a condemnation. The Dean of Liberal Arts and Human Sciences at the time assured me that I wouldn't be fired, but that didn't mean I'd be free of punishment, which takes many forms in academe. Ostracism is the old standard that Virginia Tech would use. Three or four colleagues offered support. For everyone else, I simply ceased to exist. It's a horrible thing to be abandoned in a moment of tremendous need. That the abandonment is predicated on self-preservation makes it even worse. Let me talk for a second about ostracism in academe. It's used as a method of coercion and also as a punishment for defiance. Nearly all norms in academe function to affect conformity. We don't spend much time discussing ostracism, mostly because ostracism serves power and serving power is baked into the industry's DNA. But discussing ostracism also contravenes deeply embedded notions of professional etiquette. So let's discuss it, even if we're not supposed to, because we're not supposed to. Getting ostracized hurts. God damn, does it hurt. It hurts with a special intensity if you come from a community of undesirables and already have a lifetime of rejection to sort. Being Palestinian in academe, for example, means that asserting the simple fact of your existence leads to all kinds of hostility. Never mind actually making basic demands for respect and equality that come with the assertion. It's a stunning form of repression, insidious and systematic, almost incomprehensible, but for the fact that it keeps happening in full view of the world, despite an equally insidious and systematic unwillingness to acknowledge the problem. The same holds in different ways for black and indigenous people and various other groups seen as expendable in the intellectual marketplace. Palestinians face punishment at an extraordinary rate in academe from undergrads to tenured professors. It's the open secret of today's debates about free speech and cancel culture. Those debates largely fail because they refuse to account for the most conspicuous instances of political repression today. Within academe, Zionist recrimination is still a niche issue or worse, a topic of disrepute. That's why it's so brutally effective. You get punished merely for recognizing the punishment. Let's take a broader view of the situation. We understand that racism necessarily involves disparities of power, that it's not simply a matter of individual preference and prejudice. So why are we allowing Zionists to dictate what Palestinians can and cannot say? Palestinians have virtually no power on campus or off for that matter. Moreover, it is Israel, not the Palestinians, with a nuclear arsenal, an unequal judicial system, and unconditional backing from the United States. Yet conservatives and liberals alike have decided that merely asserting a Palestinian identity is grounds for discipline. Here is an example of how voracious racism can be without a countervailing force. The old adage, which I've always found horrible, informs us that children should be seen and not heard. We haven't even achieved the status of childishness, that familiar colonial category for natives, because our mandate is to be both unseen and unheard. So what's left? Complete inhumanity. This is a type of ostracism that doesn't arise from bad behavior or what's perceived to be bad behavior. It's an intrinsic feature of campus life and plays a significant role in graduate admissions, hiring, tenure, promotion, publishing, awards, mobility, networking, grant writing, pedagogy, campus climate, and academic freedom. Many of you don't have to do anything to earn ostracism. You earned it the moment you stepped onto campus by biology alone. 
Ostracism is built into the professorial economy. If peer review doesn't maintain order, then upper administrators and politicians are happy to do the job. I said a moment ago that a humanities professor is supposed to think critically. I was being a bit coy. It's not actually what a humanities professor is supposed to do. In the corporate university, critical thinking is more a brand than an avocation. Applying sharp criticism to structures of power is okay if they exist in another country, especially an official enemy, or to a bygone era of US history, but to apply it in the present against one's own government, against one's own campus even, that's not critical thinking. It's barbarity. So we have to examine critical thinking as a signifier, dynamic and ambiguous. It has a normative definition, a tacit definition, and an ideal definition. One of the hallmarks of graduate training is learning to comprehend those definitions and applying the correct one as needed for professional success. Pardon me. So I have a lot to say about Virginia Tech, but I want to spare you the ennui of listening to me complain. Well, complaining about my individual predicament anyway. I have plenty of complaints about the state of academe. My history with Virginia Tech, however, does illustrate various problems within the industry. Anything I say about Virginia Tech more or less applies to US academe in general. During the backlash to my essay, I was condemned and threatened specifically as an Arab, as a foreigner, even though I was born in West Virginia, and as a Muslim, even though I'm Christian. My ethnicity, perceived or real, was central to the backlash. I don't claim that being white would have mitigated the public's fury, but it strikes me as important that a distinctly racialized reaction emerged as if organically. It wasn't, of course, organic. Hammering on my brownness was the immediate response, which enlivened the premise of the essay that dehumanization is inherent to US militarism. Virginia Tech offered no recognition of this monstrous explicit racism directed at one of its employees. To the contrary, the university's spokesperson encouraged the mob's hatred. This too is a reality you'll face on campus. Diversity is attached to institutional accumulation. And in this condition, it becomes a mechanism to discipline the recusant. Better a plagiarist or a sexual predator than a principled anti-imperialist. And by the way, my old department, English, had a Nazi teaching composition a few years ago. Not a grammar Nazi either, a bona fide blood and soil Nazi. Did the university condemn his politics, make it clear that it doesn't share his values, encourage the community to ostracize him? Of course not. The university defended his right to free speech. This wasn't because of inconsistency or individual lapses of judgment. Humoring Nazis and sex pests while chastising ethnic and ideological undesirables is concordant to the actual mission of the corporate university. In the end, it has no choice but to accommodate reactionaries because they're reliable soldiers of the corporate university's class interests. Don't fool yourself into thinking that the administrative class will defend your subversive ideas on principle. The calculus at play mixes dogma with convenience. Civil liberties come and go depending on their utility. When administrators claim to value critical thinking, they're lying to you. Well, maybe they're not lying per se, but they sure as hell aren't being honest. There's a difference between critical thinking as an unbounded practice capable of disrupting orthodoxy and critical thinking as a rhetorical commodity. The normative definition of critical thinking doesn't prioritize either criticism or thought. It is hopelessly intertwined with professional rewards and public relations. There are conditions attached to critical thinking as envisioned by administrators and no small number of professors. Optimally, critical thinking is supposed to be incompatible with institutional norms. 
critical thinking isn't supposed to suffer ideological constraints. But in the corporate university, critical thinking cannot supersede its own corporatization. This form of critical thinking has unstated but distinct boundaries. We're all aware of them, if only implicitly. That's how you know they're real. Nobody discusses them, and yet everybody enforces their limitations. Traverse those boundaries, and critical thinking gets redefined as sedition, as infantilism, as incivility. <clears throat> Pardon me. A few moments ago, I mentioned text principles of community. Well, let's focus on them for a second as an example of typical PR messaging. On its own, PR messaging isn't objectionable. We recognize that modern universities need to bang on about their superior campus climates, if only to compete for top students and faculty. The problem isn't that the messaging fails to live up to its promise. It's that the messaging upholds principles in stark contrast to the messaging. If you go to any random university website and peruse its version of the principles, the first thing you should notice is that the covenant is inclusive to the point of being useless. There's usually mention of racism and sexism and so forth, but placed in equal standing to things like ideological diversity and respect for military personnel. It's the all lives matter approach to public relations. These principles work selectively, of course, according to an action's disadvantage or benefit to power, by taking no particular stand, that is, by treating campus as neutral political terrain, they ensure preservation of the status quo. In this sense, they generally parallel the limits of academic freedom. I'm not speaking of academic freedom as an idea or a legal protection. I'm concerned with how it actually performs amid a set of material realities. Those material realities most notably include sexual violence, structural racism, increased precarity, legislative hostility, exorbitant tuition, obscene student debt, and an ever-growing administrative class. We cannot understand academic freedom without also understanding the context of access and enforcement in which it operates. In other words, academic freedom isn't a universal right, and not just because of uneven Im implementation either. Some workers on campus simply have no academic freedom, no matter how badly apologists for managerial venality want to dissemble about technicalities. What academic freedom do graduate students enjoy? Student activists, adjuncts. They enjoy the principle of academic freedom, maybe, but in reality, they can be punished for stepping out of line without much recourse. It's one reason why the higher ups fill classrooms with contingent instructors. Sure, economics play a significant role, but management likes the idea of a workforce that can be terminated at will. Somebody pisses you off, somebody annoys the donors, somebody runs afoul of the local business community. You don't have to fire them for being uncivil and then worry about a lawsuit. Just decline to renew the contract. Sorry, pal, enrollments are down this year. We're gonna have to let you go. And this is to say nothing about other essential campus workers who don't even enjoy the principle of academic freedom, such as maintenance and kitchen staff, bus drivers, landscapers, and so forth. We should also bear in mind that academic freedom isn't static or immutable. Its provisions are deeply contested and flexible according to local circumstance. Moreover, if it's to have any enforcement mechanism, academic freedom relies on institutions constitutionally hostile to the dispossessed. Academic freedom doesn't supply the answers to problems of racism and sexual violence. At its best, it protects workers from sanction, but it cannot intervene into actual sites of material struggle. Academic freedom is largely contingent on, contingent on tenure, and even then it's not guaranteed. With the erosion of tenure, academic freedom becomes a limited commodity. As its limits increase, so it increases in value. Thus, tenure becomes a ready-made enticement to good behavior. Management has effectively conscripted the beneficiaries of academic freedom into facilitating its erosion. 
Like any other precious resource, academic freedom grows in demand as industry leaders restrict its distribution. It's quickly becoming a luxury item. A misanthropic observer might come to the conclusion that tenure is a fantastic inducement to conformity. I'm not arguing against the importance of academic freedom. I believe it to be a crucial aspect of higher education along with tenure. I'm asking you simply to recognize its limitations, to examine its presence in relation to systems of power. Doing so provides impetus to rethink the conditions in which we study and work, and perhaps to reimagine the prospects of higher education altogether. There's a reason that the gentrified classes on campus dismiss such endeavors as unsophisticated. If we try to ensure that everyone on campus can enjoy adequate protections and a healthy workplace environment, then we'll necessarily be participating in a great act of subversion. Pardon me. Let's take a second and explore how time is structured in the modern corporate university. You probably spend a lot of time thinking about how you spend your time. The habit ties into notions of productivity and accomplishment. What must I do to earn a good grade? What will make me an attractive job candidate? What are the criteria for tenure and promotion? What is required of me to be a good campus citizen? Note that you have no say in these matters. They are dicta handed down from above and can change without warning. Anybody who's gone through tenure knows that. The supposedly democratic system is in fact hierarchical, but we, we can leave that aside. Even democracy wouldn't alleviate the problem I have in mind. When we talk about the structure of time in academe, it's really an issue of labor rights, which the tenured professoriate, with some exceptions, is loath to discuss. Much of the job of an assistant professor or an adjunct consists of paperwork and metrics and surveys and bean counting and a whole bunch of other bureaucratic rigmarole. We spend our time, in other words, getting inculcated into institutional culture. When people complain about the difficulties of academe, they're generally not talking about teaching and writing. They usually have in mind bad colleagues, abusive relationships, absurd service obligations, endless assessment rituals, and inscrutable administrators. That is to say, the difficulties exist in the very institutional culture so aggressively touted as civilized and urbane. Something needs to change. Nearly everything needs to change. Oh, hold on, you might be saying. Is this guy opposing objective standards of assessment? The answer is, yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing. This stuff about commodification and alienation has been discussed at great length, predating Marx, but we have to keep asking what it looks like in our current material circumstances. How are certain forces organized to affect fealty among people supposedly obliged to irreverence or even blasphemy? Where can we find meaning if sites of inquiry are governed by a practical need to placate and mollify? Simply stated, in the current configuration of the corporate university, much of our labor is devoted to surviving mendacity. You can always leave academe, of course, but that seems a lot to ask of people who got into the business because it promised a better ethical standard than the corporate world. I prefer a more state, straightforward solution. Defy, struggle, misbehave. To do that, we should first reassess and challenge vocabularies we might otherwise take for granted. Let's start with success. What does it mean in this profession? Landing a tenure track gig, achieving tenure, becoming a full professor, publications, international recognition, keynote speeches. Okay, but by which means can we viably succeed if the entire notion is predicated on the uncommon, the exceptional? Can one be considered a success in less traditional, perhaps less prestigious ways? Certainly but not if it requires the consent of thought leaders and opinion makers for whom the current system works just fine. 
So the task of redefinition falls to us. That means we agitate against normative ideas of success and many other professional standards, which expertly do so little to justify their survival. We have to quit reproducing the harmful commonplaces of an industry given to injury and abuse. Going along with the normal state of affairs, genuflecting to the brand, to the fancy degree, to the star scholar, might not make you complicit in the injury and abuse, but it doesn't do much to change them. Why do senior scholars wield so much power over their grad students? Because their recommendation can sink or save a student's career. Well, why do we need to heed the authority of senior scholars? Who says we have to trust their opinions? Why cede so much power over hiring decisions to an outsider? Maybe it would be better to banish letters of recommendation altogether. I sat on or observed plenty of search committees in my day. I promise you that a search committee has everything it needs to make an informed hire simply by reading a candidate's work and interviewing the candidate. The letters are essentially an exercise in deference. If you can't know what you need to know about a person by reading their writing, then you don't need to be deciding whom to put in a classroom. Instead of rep reproducing the slavish customs of awe and deferral, let's commit to recalcitrance. Let's nurture our own visions of success. It's in the imagination, after all, that material realities first come into existence. We're trained to conceptualize rewards as salary and status, right? Professorships, affiliations, access, awards, things of that nature. But let me propose that rewards aren't merely objects, that they're psychological instruments as well. Few things are more rewarding than doing right by members of your community. Few things are more rewarding than trust and companionship. Few things are more rewarding than company among the dispossessed and downtrodden. Few things, for that matter, are more rewarding than staring down your oppressor. This industry structures our relationships to be antagonistic. We're forced to compete for increasingly meager resources. Social capital isn't something you can just pick up by going to class. It's something you pursue at the expense of others. There's, there is no abundance. The credentials that signify prestige are limited commodities. You're an individual brand marketing yourself to centers of power. Access is important. It doesn't come without the right gestures. Pedigree is crucial. You don't get it without a rigorous audition. You see, this emphasis on upward mobility, this insistence that higher ups constantly need to be appeased is inherently demeaning. You have to suppress passion. You have to sell yourself. What is networking at base other than salesmanship? You have to be inoffensive. But who are we supposed to not offend? Administrative assistants? Janitors? Of course not. We can be horrible to them. We can't offend the nabobs who are already dominant. A final word about recalcitrance is it's been my favorite concept for many years. It's a pretty simple thing. Don't act in service to the dominant culture of academe or politics or media or whatever to the degree that you have any autonomy. If you know something is harmful, then withhold your participation or at the very least, don't facilitate the harm. If you know somebody to be toxic or abusive, then you needn't defer to their recommendations. Oh. You're a famous philosopher in a top 10 department. That's nice. You're also a strike breaker. Wow, you're a New York Times bestseller. Whatever, you're also a serial predator. We're trained in a million subtle and a few explicit ways to let prestige override the strike breaking and predation. It needn't be that way. I get that you have to survive and that senior faculty and administrators play a great role in your survival. In the end, we're dealing with systematic, systemic problems that can't be ascribed to the individual. But you can act on the little things in your control. 
decency is so often an impediment to professional success, not because humans are inherently corrupt, but because centers of power are deeply invested in cynicism and conformity. Refusing to become cynical can be a great act of resistance. And refusing to conform doesn't isolate you. It puts you in community with an entire world of gifted intellectuals. If you're of a particular disposition, one that values independence of spirit, then subversion presupposes survival. Even in your loneliest moments, you may find that you already belong to lively fugitive geographies within and beyond the moribund norms of the corporate university. I suppose what I'm trying to say is that it's okay to be on the periphery, embrace the condition, build your career from the outside in. Instead of mourning what you imagine to be missing out on, pay attention to the wonderful opportunities for inquiry and connection that exist among the castaways. It's where you'll find all the interesting people. It's also where you'll find meaningful work, not mechanical line items for the CV, but the kind of labor that can make life on campus better, professionally and emotionally. Organizing a union, pushing for a living wage, seeking accountability for sexual predators, agitating to divest from imperialism. Basically, action trained on collective power or on mitigating the damage of metropolitan institutions on the global south. I've heard a bit about those efforts here at Virginia Tech and find them to be inspiring. Without direct action, life is a whole lot of malaise. And surely those of you who participate in direct action have discovered that it's capable of producing a sense of community the university promises, but simply cannot deliver. That's the thing, that we can't do it alone, but we don't have to. In our recalcitrance, we give life to the imagination. Only there can we find the desiccated ideals of higher education, listless and frazzled, waiting for us to put them back together. Pardon me. I reckon you've indulged me long enough, so it hardly seems fair to end on a few personal notes, but again, I request your graciousness. I'm always a bit self-conscious when speaking to an audience, especially one composed of academics. It's not that I suffer imposter syndrome or whatever you wanna call it, although that certainly plays a role. I suppose I'm uneasy with the way that academe trains us to think. We read to find problems, to discredit, to be the smartest person in the room. Sure, in many cases, criticism has plenty of cause to be ruthless, but ruthlessness has a way of overwhelming the human dimensions of critique, those ideals and ideas that inspire a sense of worldliness, a sense of obligation to the non-scholars of the world. How easy is it to forget that we're here to serve students and the communities we purport to represent, not the egomaniacal needs of our superiors? This ease of forgetfulness isn't accidental. It's a ready-made culture that we walk into, diplomas in hand. We're educated to complexify everything, but I'm rather tired of that formula. Some things need to be simplified. For example, Zionism is inhuman. Anti-Black racism is ubiquitous. Capitalism is leading us to ecocide. US imperialism never serves the common good. These facts need no nuance. Sometimes fuck that or fuck them is all the theoretical analysis you need. And yet all the highfalutin sensibilities about complicating this and nuancing that go out the window when a radical colleague needs to be disciplined. I'd like to say I've grown accustomed to being dismissed as crude, uncouth, polemical, vulgar, and so forth, but I remain sensitive to those epithets. They're not disinterested observations. They have a material impact. They, they cost me a livelihood for starters and ensure that no US institution will intercede on my behalf. When I was fired from the University of Illinois, 
unjustly, according to every, every legal body of note, not a single college or university president decried the obvious abrogation of my academic freedom or the far reaching harm to the field of indigenous studies. Not a single college or university said, this man was wronged and we owe it to the profession to get him a job. Not a single one. Hundreds of them had plenty to say about the sanctity of academic freedom a year earlier when the American Studies Association passed a BDS resolution. The brave graduate students here at Virginia Tech who recently affirmed BDS are familiar with the routine. When I pissed off the military clack at Virginia Tech, not a single tenured professor in my department spoke up on my behalf. They let me face the racism and the death threats on my own. I didn't get a single email saying, sorry, this is happening to you, much less an expression of solidarity. Yeah, they were scared. I understand that. Fear isn't a good excuse though. It means that my colleagues should have understood the importance of empathizing with my situation. Beyond an overly refined survival instinct, their silence was also a tacit acknowledgement that we're governed by spiteful and unforgiving forces. There's your connection between ostracism and conformity. That's what I mean when I say the ideals into which we're inculcated only hold in geographies of deference. When things get serious, critical thinking and antagonistic inquiry are quickly exposed as a whole lot of hot air. The principles of community turn out to be just another limited commodity. And so what do we end up with? A sharp depletion of academic freedom. Academic freedom, after all, is unnecessary if the workers police themselves. In the end, I got tired of always being in trouble even though I'd never mistreated anyone in my life as a professor, even though I was only doing what was supposed to be my job. I can tell you that the job is infinitely easier without an academy to worry about. I went on to become a bus driver and now I'm preparing for whatever comes next. I go forth with enthusiasm because things in academe don't have to be this way. They don't have to be this way. We don't have to concede to what management considers inevitable. And that's exactly what the grad student and young scholar must constantly repeat. Things don't have to be this way. I'll control what I can control, which is my recalcitrance, my commitment to empathy. And if it leads me away from this corpse of a profession, then so be it. But for those who proceed and those who remain, think carefully about what kind of scholar and critic you want to be. Not what convention says you're supposed to be, but what you desire to become based on a lifetime of experience. It took me many years to come up with a methodology suitable to my sense of usefulness in the world, and I still haven't fully sorted it. When you've been ostracized, you begin to think of criticism not as an exercise in humiliation or one-upmanship. You become much more concerned about the possibilities of criticism as a form of compassion. Bear in mind that compassion doesn't necessarily mean politeness or timidity. Sometimes it means getting angry on behalf of the dispossessed. It can be as simple as rejecting normative versions of critical thinking, those that gratify centers of power through opacity or compliance. Or it can take a more active form, devotion to the well being of the destitute, the persecuted, the unseen. Compassion isn't a disembodied emotion, it's fundamentally connected to justice. It means refusing to abandon those in need of solidarity for the sake of reputation or career. Done right, compassion requires a bit of incivility. I remember when I was at the American University of Beirut, AUB, as the Edward Said Chair of American Studies. I'd been hired a year after the Illinois fiasco and, and things were well. 
The American Studies program advertised searches for a new chair and an assistant professor. I applied for the chair position and was selected by the search committee and approved by the dean. A candidate for assistant professor was identified and offered. I prepared my family for at least a few more years in Beirut. As we were closing the deal, the university president intervened and shut down both appointments. In my case, he was acting on behest of at least two US senators and quite likely the embassy, which has long put its fingers in AUB's business. I was kept on for one more lame duck year. Administrators installed a white American woman as chair without any kind of search or consultation with faculty. The new chair hadn't accomplished anything really. I was upset. It sucks when some minion gets a job for which you're qualified and it does no use to pretend otherwise. I'm not classy like that. I have no grace for quizlings and bootlickers. I'm wary of highly credentialed people too. I may not necessarily hate them, but I certainly don't trust them. And not because I'm some hirsute barbarian with primitive emotional processing, but because I'm actually well-versed in modernity. I understand the properties of class. I understand what compels highly credentialed people to protect their economic interests. And I understand that only rarely do the highly credentialed break character. Anyway, back to the AUB situation. We were a department of two, literally two. The new chair who came out of nowhere with zero training or experience in American studies and me. The chair was essentially a scab. The situation was awkward enough when I got word that she had referred to me as feral. I was pretty stunned and none too pleased, as you might imagine. And I knew she didn't mean it in a nasty way exactly, but nastiness was certainly inscribed in the diction. Here's a white American earning an exorbitant salary in an economically troubled Middle Eastern country making extremely dubious comments about an Arab man she had helped screw out of a job. This, by the way, is exactly the kind of insane situation that faculty of color deal with in modern academe, in case you're wondering about our legendary anger. Well, for a long time, I was upset. I left Beirut in a state of disgrace, just as I had left Blacksburg three years earlier and returned to the United States still feeling upset. In time though, something began to change. I started considering what it means to be feral in such a cultured environment. It didn't seem like a bad idea. The chair hadn't used the term as a compliment, but I came to view it as one. For in important ways, I am feral. Refusing demands to be civil might not be an expression of ferality, but it codes as one among the cultured. A feral creature hasn't been made captive or has reverted to wildness from a state of domestication. Leaving academe, as more and more people are doing, sort of fits the paradigm of escaping captivity. Rattling cages fits the paradigm as well. Being feral, of course, has negative connotations for people whose bodies, by flesh or ability, are marked as savage. But we remain feral even after having been seemingly accepted. Those in control of the categories aren't convinced of our presence in these grand institutions. They wait for a reversion to incivility. Not even the most earnest capitalist can process surplus into modernity. Think of ferality is that part of yourself untamed by convention, more as a philosophical than physical state of being, feral in the sense of being fierce, incorruptible, defiant, uncivil, not for its own sake, as an intrinsic fidelity to decolonization, as a rebuke of corporate pedagogy. I like to remind myself that humans can try to mine asteroids for sustenance, but will never invent a way to survive without water. I don't regret how I've been expunged from any academic job. 
But I deeply regret having spent so much effort making myself presentable. You see, the only power I had, the only dignity left to my name was tied entirely to recalcitrance. That's because it's necessary to disengage before undertaking any grand gestures of rebellion. No matter how spectacular it ends up being, resistance always begins with the simple act of withholding approval. And really, what other choice is there anymore? You can do all the right things, kiss all the right haunches, soldier on with impeccable pragmatism, but in the end, if you want life in an industry hell bent on automation, then it's probably advisable to go at least a little bit wild. Thank you, I'm done and I'm, I'm happy now to to field uh, comments or take questions or, or, or whatever. And thank you again for, for your patience in, in humoring me. I, I think I can speak for everybody to say that uh, uh, Encore first and foremost, uh, and, and second that, uh, unbelievable, uh, no words. Um, thankfully other people have words in the form of questions, which is the best I'm gonna get at this segue. It always feels terrible by the way, transitioning from just a brilliant moment of rhetoric, this closing word that leaves you calling to action. Uh, and then I have to be like, and now we're gonna stop everything to a halt to ask questions, but that's what we're gonna do. Um, so just as a reminder to folks, in the Zoom room, please use the Q&A feature and we'll make sure to get questions to Stephen. One of them is already just the word brilliant, which uh, <laughs> is more of a comment than a question, but a good comment nonetheless. Um, and I highly encourage you to take advantage of that. For those watching on YouTube, please use the Google form that we have linked there and I'll make sure that we get the questions to them. Uh, we already have one queued and ready, so folks have a moment to type them out. Um, Nazia joining from Philly, which is fantastic. Shout out to Philly. Um, asks, can you share your thoughts on the limitations and possibilities of university unions slash bargaining units for faculty and staff? And I'm gonna throw in grad students there. I think that's in the spirit of the question. Absolutely, and and hi Nazia, it's it's great to 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 see you, if only virtually. I know I know the questioner as um, you know a wonderful friend first of all, but uh, a, a brilliant scholar of Islam, race, and power, and and a bunch of other things also. And also shout out to to the Philly crew. Um, I I don't know that I'm I'm well placed to to answer the question in terms of, of nuts and bolts. And, and really, I, 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 I know they probably won't want to, and I don't want to put them on the spot, but I, I, I welcome you know um, Jack and the other VT grad students who, who have literally been through this process to, to barge in, displace me, and um, share their thoughts and, and strategies if, if they have any. I, I would be interested in hearing it as well. I, I'm really, because I haven't done any um, academic union organizing in, in a really long time. And when I was at Virginia Tech, there, were, there was nothing like this going on. There was talk of a union among, you know, a, a few of my colleagues, um, among a few graduate students, but it, it was, wasn't really part of, of our consciousness at that time. And this is between the years of, of 2006 and 2013. Obviously things have changed at Virginia Tech and a lot of other places in, in the interim. Anyway, I can offer maybe some um, conceptual comments. I, I don't know if they will be helpful or not, but I, do, I remember I was giving a talk um, years ago at, at a poli-sci conference. Um, I don't know why they invited me either. Uh, I, I'm honored, you know, it, it, it went well. Like, um, you know, I, they, they, they didn't kick me out. So I'm, you know, I, I, I assumed that, that I, I did enough to, you know, to keep myself solvent among them. But I, I sort of went on a, a, a pretty long tangent about the, the importance of developing forms of collective power on campus. And somebody in the audience said, well, unions. You know, that's what you're saying, unions. And I agreed at the time, but later on it kept bugging me because um, I, I didn't think the union should be the totality of, of the answer. Um, I think unions certainly play a critical role in developing modes of collective power on campus for, for faculty, adjuncts, um, grad students, uh, you know, physical plant laborers really across the the the, the entire uh, non-administrative uh, categories of labor. 
I think also one thing that that puts a I think it's more clear cut um, when it's a graduate student union or an instructor's union or a bus driver's union or, or whatever the case may be sometimes than a faculty union because even though we disagree or we should disagree with the the court decisions that and the administrative narratives that proclaim tenured faculty to be part of management, very often, you know, even though they're not part of management, they behave as if they're part of management, right? And so we have to understand exactly what the class composition of the community is that is seeking to be unionized because the class composition is gonna tell us a lot about what kind of union it's gonna be, first of all, and second of all, and more important, what kind of work it might be able to get done. So I think that, you know, there are, are, are radical unions and then there are unions that, that, that sort of hew towards a more conservative or a more moderate side. Um, so I, I like to think of, of unionizing just like battles uh, to preserve academic freedom as, as part of a, a broader package of, of resistance strategies, if, if you will, if that makes any sense. Um, that, Anything that gets instructors potentially a lower teaching load, uh, better contract guarantees, better health care, you know, anything, anything that gets them uh, material benefits. Same for grad students. Anything that gets grad students better material benefits is absolutely worth pursuing, right? Mm -hmm. Even if the union ends up being shitty, it doesn't matter. If, if it's, if it's, Get, if it's improving their labor conditions, it's doing what it was meant to do first and foremost. And, and that in, in that moment is the most important thing because people need living wages. They need, you know, they need their, their teaching loads reduced. They need more sick time, et cetera, et cetera. They need proper health care, on and on and on. And universities, of course, are loath to provide those things. But at the same time, that's a conversation in relation to what a union should be doing. And if we're talking about broader questions of, of what we can do to transform universities into more equitable institutions, into institutions that that don't have uh, you know, horrible track records around um, racism and exploitation of the global south and sexual violence and on and on. The union certainly plays a role, but uh, the, the union might not have time for that, or the union might not not have the will or the mood for that. So it needs to happen either way. Um, in the end, though, I, I would go back to the, the, the class composition of the formation that is being put together, and that will tell you a lot about uh, what its potential is as a unit of collective action. But I, I, I fully, of course, support um, unionization. I think that, that, that there's a ton of, of potential in unions. I think unions also, unfortunately, are, are given to, to you know, the, the emergence or infiltration of, of people who are subtly or tacitly going to be working in, the, in managerial interests. And those who are involved in unions need to be aware of that and, and, and try to make sure that that doesn't happen. And I, sorry, Nazia, I hope I, I answered your question in any kind of useful way. And maybe I, I better ought to get to the next one. No, I think that was very helpful. And I, I do wanna say something really quick on this point because it, it came up a lot during the living wage campaign, right? Like a lot of people noticed that, you know, we were out here doing it, we were fighting and it looked a lot like union organizing tactics. And uh, I've been here for four years. Uh, I am open about being a radical and I get to be certain levels of loudness as a white dude that others don't. So I get sent a lot of the grad students who are seen as like the feisty ones or the political ones. Uh, and I typically, they, the first thing they always want to do right is start a union. And in years past, I sat them down and I explained the challenges. I talked about what would work, what doesn't, what I have experience with and all that jazz. And I never see them again. Uh, something's changed in the last two years, whether because of changing political climates, whether uh, uh, it's the legacy of these massive protest movements across the United States, whether it's simply COVID making people realize that if we don't fucking work together, we're screwed or all of the <laughs> above, but something's changing. So what I would tell people is uh, send me an email and we can talk about options and I'm happy to, to get you plugged in. 
Uh, I'm exhausted, so I probably won't be like running a union anytime soon, but uh, I, am I am connected with all the local organizations who are doing work. And if you have that energy and you want to make change and, and you see that it's possible, please reach out to me and I'll make sure that happens. So that's from the student perspective. We got a ton of fantastic questions. So there's always that talk, like if you're the speaker, there's that fear that there's not enough questions. It's not a problem, Stephen, just letting you know that now. Uh, okay. So now I'll ask, uh, can you share your thoughts on maintaining a solid sense of self while dealing with a committee? Uh, and I think the spirit of the question is just like the university. How do you, how do you maintain that solid sense of self? Okay, um, well, th thank you for the question. Um, it's, it's a difficult, I mean, it seems like a straightforward question um, and it's presented in a straightforward way, but it's not, it's not an easy thing to, to, to answer, which I guess is probably why you're, you're, you're raising the topic in the first place. Um, I, I'm gonna do something here because I, I, genius that I am figured out how to click on the Q and A link. And I think that this question fits in very yeah. perfectly with something that and, um, uh, Amanda Burroughs asked. And Amanda, I, I recognize your name from Twitter. That, that, that's how I recognize people these days. You say, have, and Amanda asks, how do you emotionally withstand always being the problem in the room, being the person who never stops pissing off the powers that be? So I, I kind of want to take those together because I was going to veer into Amanda's question in, in my initial response to Sanal in the first place. I, I think this 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 kind of I, I don't know how you describe it these I guess uh, existential uh, problems that the people feel in academia and I know that it, it can be really acute among grad students and 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 junior scholars junior faculty. It's, it's that's probably what I I hear more and more about and uh, I have tried to, to to write about it and to think through it. They, there's obviously no universal answer in the end we're we're individuals getting through in in these institutional cultures and and not only are our individual needs different but the the institutions themselves are different but let's say i'm going to use tech as a point of of reference since you know you all are there and 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 i've had a lot of experience there tech always had and and this is well before um, you know the the horrible tragedy um, you know in in 2006, I, I, I grew up in in tech's orbit. It, it's always had a real rah rah spirit. You know, it's it's very um, you know like uh, micro patriotic or or whatever. You know, we we you know we are Virginia Tech, we are hokey. And I look, I don't have any problem with that. I don't have any problem with with anybody who who moves that way. That's fine. But I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that it that makes the campus and this is true probably of most campuses if not all of them makes them you know at least innately or tacitly hostile to professions of of dissent or skepticism and you're often made to 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 feel like you need to be a good team player and in order to be a good team player, you have to do X, Y, and Z, right? According to what's good for the department or, or the larger campus. And then th there's a, a feeling of, of exploitation that, that often comes up in that, that we're meant, to, um, that we're meant to, to suppress, again, for the good of the greater community. Well, you don't lose your sense of self first of all by doing your very best to the degree that it's possible for you to maintain a, a life outside of campus um i'm a big believer in that i, I you know i know that a, a lot of us have shitty family situations but if you have a decent family life you know participate in it you know if if you have a, a circle of of friends or acquaintances that you have fun with that that you know, aren't in your department or at your school or aren't in academe in, in, in general, lean on them as well. The, the, you know, this, this sense of, of this siphling atmosphere comes into existence when it's, it's all grad school all the time. And I don't think that it's, it's especially healthy emotionally or intellectually. 
you have to figure out also where you're going to draw a line um, in the committee meetings, uh, any place else. Like, okay, I'm willing to do X, Y, and Z for this department or for this university or or for my peers or whatever, but you know, I, I'm not willing to do A, B, and C. All right, there, there's a line here, and I'm very clear about where that line is, and I ha have to build up the courage to express that reticence should it come up. I'm not going to, in other words, um, you know, for me, the example would be, um, I'm, I'm not gonna sign on to, um, you know, to, uh, to a, a, a pro-Israel speaker, all right? That, that's my line, okay? So you're gonna have to find somebody else to do that kind of labor. Um, I'm not going to sign on to a, a policy because we're asked out an inconvenience that makes life harder for grad students. All right. That that's my line. That happens in, in committee among faculty all the time, by the way. Right. Let's let's very often when faculty are in committee, they, they're not much thinking about what's best for the students. They often are thinking about what's best for them or what's best for the department. Do you understand what I? And so th those were my lines. All right, and and my sense of self was 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 tied into staying on the right side of the line. I'm yammering. I always feel like I'm answering these questions poorly because it it always to my ear sounds vapid. But um, there there is something deeply important about deciding. I'm not going to lose myself completely to what the institution wants me to be. Okay, and, and you want to maintain a solid sense of who you are ethically and what you want to accomplish by being a scholar or a researcher or a teacher, whatever. And you're not going to be able to do that properly if you feel that you've made more compromises than your intellect or your sense of ethics can accommodate. I want to address Amanda's question even more specifically about always being the problem. Um, that's, you know, that's that's a really intimate question, and and I want I want to give it a serious answer, and I think it ties into what what um, what I was just saying. Um, it happens for me in a different way, maybe than it, it sounds like it might happen for for you. I'm extremely timid, so I, I tend to sit sit there and stew and then um decide later on that that you know fuck that i'm not doing that right <laughs> or y'all are crazy i'm not doing it you know I, of course i would speak out um if, if if i felt that it was important or necessary always for the students if, if i thought the students were you know all my time as as a professor if I, students were getting a raw deal i would say something of course um if palestine came up people of color issues of racism i i i would always say something and there was such a heavy weight on my head all the time about being the dude who always has to ruin everything. I still feel that way, Amanda, like all the time. You know, I, I, I'm like really involved in Palestine solidarity work, okay? And so I, you know, people be, uh, you know, like fawning all over like, you know, like a Hollywood so like Mark Ruffalo or, or the squad or something. And I'll say, well, actually what they just said kind of sucks you know, and, and maybe we should be a little more circumspect before just, you know, falling to our knees and, and, and praising them for liberating us, right? And you know exactly what kind of answers come because it's the same thing that we're talking about, right? That you're a purist, you're this, you're that, why? You, you've, you're made to feel like you're the motherfucker who's always ruining it for everybody else, right? The things would be so much easier, right? And everybody would be free if only that one person would shut the fuck up and, and go away, right? The, 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 you, you're the constant complicating factor, right? I hope I'm capturing uh, the, the essence of the, of the problem that you're raising to me. Well, there's only one way around it, uh, in my opinion. I, I, if you find a better one, email me, Twitter DM me, whatever. I'm, I'm all ears. <laughs> I'll, give, like, I'll pay you. Like there's, there's, cause it's extremely, but you just have to say, I don't give a fuck. Hey, see, like point blank. You just have to say, I'm going to be the bad guy then, right? Because my devotion, my devotion is, is to the people being talked about, not to the people who are talking, right? My, my mind and my heart are in Palestine. And I'm always asking myself, well, what does this shit sound like to the ear of the people in Palestine, right? Or what does this shit sound like to, you know, to, to, you know, to, the, to the colossal 
population of 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 black uh, prisoners, right? Well, what does all this sound like to them? What what is it? It doesn't sound pragmatic to them. It sounds pragmatic pragmatic to you. It doesn't sound pragmatic to them, right? To them, it just means they're going to keep on suffering, right? And so you just you just have to keep going, right? And always remember which community it is that you're ultimately looking to, to, to please and which community that you're there to serve. And, and that's the only thing that gets me through it. Mostly, but I have a huge hangups. I'm extremely, extremely sensitive about, you know, being that guy, being uh, that asshole who's, who's always, you know, who's never impressed. Who's, I'm impressed all the time. You don't see me talking shit about people resisting in Gaza. I'm, I'm extremely impressed with them. You know, you don't see me uh, complaining about the, 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 the people in the West Bank rising up, right? I'm extremely impressed with them. Who I'm not impressed with are, are Western people with PhDs telling everybody to be more moderate, more moderate, more moderate when they speak on behalf of, of a community, right? That they're not even there to represent themselves. You know what I mean? So that's what you constantly have to remind yourself. It's just for Amanda, for everybody, that, that who am I serving, right? Who, whose interests am I looking after? Right? Who, who do I want to please? And what would I sound like if I took this discourse, this language, this narrative, and sat in a room with the people I'm pretending to represent and said it to them? Would they be happy with me or would they kick me the fuck out of there and be like, this guy is a joke, right? Because all the shit I hear, you know, from, from you know, like the, the diasporic radical classes, right, is, is, is shit that, you know, you'd get laughed out of every single room in the Gaza Strip if, 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 if you took that crap there. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, I know that you didn't ask about Palestine. Palestine is my point of reference. Um, whatever it is issue you're dealing with, think about who you're trying to serve, all right? And if they get mad at you for, for ruining it, if they accuse you of being divisive and of, of screwing up the unity, then you shrug your shoulders and, and soldier on and say, well, then it's it's, it looks like it's time to disunify because um, I'm, I'm not changing my mind on this one and I'm not going to let you move forward with it right, without at least it, it articulating uh, my, my opposition. I'm gonna stop now um, and <laughs> move on to, to gonna, other questions. I'm if, gonna take moderator privilege and uh, if I can get uh, Bikram Guild on mute, uh, that'll be great. Mostly because I think that'll be very fun. Um, so let's see if I can figure out the technology of this um, and uh, double check me on the pin vision and all that jazz area. But go mm -hmm. ahead, Bikram, ask your question. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, great. Hey, hey, Jack. Hey, hey, Stephen. Hello. Uh, that was, uh, I, can't, I cannot uh, emphasize just how phenomenal of a talk that was. I mean, I know Jack already, already mentioned it, but um, I don't want to be uh, obviously too long with the comment either, but um, you know, like so much of what you said as somebody who just, just individually, somebody who's supposed to go up for tenure next year and just feeling, just feeling so much uh, contradiction between what you were saying about the commitment to our communities, you know, in Punjab where I'm, where my family's from, the, the farmers protests of the past year really kind of uplifted so many of us and feeling torn between the commitments there on BDS and Palestine and this need to present to oneself to get tenure. Um, in a way that distances and it, and it really tears one apart. And so that I really love the point on being feral and uh, recalcitrant and so much. And I, you know, I, I've often thought about like, you know, how th those I look up to, you know, and I, I look up to you so much, but, you know, in the past, when you think about the Fanons, you think about the, the Gramsci's, uh, the kind of funnies, you think about them producing intellectual work through comradely relationships, right? Yes. And then I think about how we are, we went from being comrades to colleagues, right? And what that, uh, what, what that, what that has done to uh, the relationship between form and content, how we produce work and what we produce, right? And so I'm, I'm wondering, right? What, what would it mean to go from be, to, to break out of this collegial colleague type of relationship that so many academics that we're, we're trapped within and to imagine how we get to that comradely horizon that so many of the people we read, right? That's where they were, right? That's, that's, that's where it was. And I guess, so that's, that's one kind of just open question. And then I'm thinking, what then is the relationship between some of the points you mentioned, right? Around being in the university, being recalcitrant, being uh, mischievous, uh, misbehaving, uh, feral, 
and broader social transformation. Like how do we think about how we feel the pressure and the weight of tenure that people are fearful and then the cowardly root of not speaking up when something happens to say what happened to you, right? And how that is informed by a political economy of who owns what in the broader society, how we are always feeling we have to beg for uh, funding from a state legislator or the deans tell us, hey, go out and get grants, go out and get, instead of us telling the dean, hey, dean, why don't you go and challenge the legislature to ask about the role that weapons companies play in the state of Virginia. I don't know, I hope, uh, I hope I'm not getting myself in trouble, but okay, uh, that, 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 these, that, these, uh, that the military industrial complex plays. Why are we depending on this to secure our line of funding? So a broader social question is required for us actually to have, um, to, to have more say balance and comfort in being feral and so forth, right? So this relationship between broader social power, property ownership, and kind of the questions you raised around the, the, um, the university. And then this, this other, I'm just curious what you think about the comrade colleague type of thing, but uh, I'll, I'll leave that there, but that, that was absolutely phenomenal. Thank you so much. Um, really nourishing and, and, and motivating talk as always. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Gill. That's, I, 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 I really don't, don't, feel like I, I I deserve such kind words and 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 I, I co-sign them. I, I do have uh, a completely unrelated question and I promise I'm sober. For the first time I got was got, I got to read the um the the, the captions. Are, are those computer generated or, or does a person do those? Computer Close generated captions. solely. Huh? It's solely computer generated. Wow, it's phenomenal because like Professor Gill was like, you know, he's, he's, there was, he was busting out some multi-syllabic words and, and they were getting them all. Anyway, okay, I'm, I'm, you, you, can, you can see how I am with technology. I, wow. Um, I, at one point in, in the prepared comments was, um, I think trying to get at the, the distinction between um, you know, a, 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 a collegial and a comradely relationship that that you, that Professor Gill, um, added a lot of substance to and uh, specified, I think, with, with really important and useful language. Maybe it would help, although you already started doing this, it would probably help me more than anybody to think through very briefly some of the, the most notable differences between being a colleague and a comrade. And certainly colleagues are gonna have a, a, a fair amount of obligation to one another, but th there does seem to be in the broadest understanding of the word, a point at, at which those obligations end. And that point is probably somewhere before the line where uh, the, the, the comradely obligations to one another would begin. And so we sort of have to push it in, in, into that uh, comrade paradigm. It's, it would fundamentally change the nature of our relationships as an instructorate right, to one another and then to management. And that those kinds of changes, in, in my opinion, are sorely needed. I would want any notion of, of uh, being a comrade to be inclusive across categories. So I, I wanted to, to emphasize that. I know that, that you were thinking the same thing that I would want it to, you know, I, I always bring up the bus drivers, right? Everybody forgets about the bus drivers, <laughs> but they, you know, they're, they, they're working hard, right? Uh, they're working hard, you know, but the groundskeepers, the people who keep the campus running. So I, I would want it to include them all the way up to, to you know, the, the tenured professorate, right? inclusive of grad students, instructors, researchers, um, everybody, the animals in, in the research labs, right? Whole thing. We start thinking of them as as comrades, then we're rebuking, if only philosophically, the stratified 
nature of, of, of our extant relationships to one another, or in many cases, non-existent relationships to one another. But a sense of comradeship, the way I imagine it, would proceed with the idea that nobody gets theirs until we all get ours, right? That, that there's, um, you know, the, if, if the assistant professors, let's say, as a class, um, win something, but, uh, you know, the, the, the groundskeepers and the graduate students are, are left behind, that a sense of comradeship would compel the assistant professors to keep pushing to make sure that everybody gets included in the distribution of whatever surplus that administration is willing to let go of. And we all know that getting the, the administration to let go of any sort of surplus is, is an extraordinarily difficult task. So it requires people power. It requires work among the, 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 the stratified classes around the campus. But there's a tremendous amount of, of intellectual capital even in a, in a small town like, like Blacksburg with a huge university right in the middle of it, right? And uh, that, that intellectual capital, you know, it exists everywhere from, from the physical workers all the way to the people in, in the classroom. And <clears throat> it could be harnessed, but you can't, you can't make some of these, you know, I think a lot of people would look at a, a, like a talk that I give to this, this evening and say, well, okay, that's all nice, but you know, the guy is living in a utopia, you know, he's, he's, he's off in, in, in La La Land uh, talking a bunch of idealistic nonsense. Well, yeah, it is uh, idealistic nonsense if, if the current relationships hold and the way that, that uh, surplus is distributed holds, but I, I don't see why it always has to be that way, right? That if, if you change the relationships, if you change our ability to access surplus, then maybe the, 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 the culture that we're all bemoaning uh, won't be able to outlast the effort. And I think that that's, uh, that, that should be the goal. I don't, um, I, I, I could talk forever. I'm going to say maybe one more line and then, uh, and then stop. <laughs> that, that I'm probably I hope this is relevant to, to the professor's question. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm on a tangent over here now. I think I'll probably have lasting trauma based on what, what happened to me at Virginia Tech. And, on, and, I, and I, I, I told myself, I'm not gonna get on camera and, and whine about this or you know, cry about it or, or do any boohoo shit, but it's true. You know, I, I think even in a lot of ways more than Illinois, Right and and in a lot of ways more than AUB, because um, you know I, I lived in Blacksburg. Um, I still don't want to tell anybody where I lived. You know I don't live there anymore. Just because I don't I don't want whoever lived in the house now to catch any shit. Right, uh, but I, I lived in Blacksburg. You all know Blacksburg. Um, it's 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 a small place. Everybody knew where I lived. And when I say I, you know. I feel like Twitter ruined the the gravity of death threats because you know everybody who wants retweets you know talk about getting death threats you know every everybody in their 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 mother has gotten death threats by now but no I got legit death threats that you know had to involve uh, the, the police a ton that you know there was a police presence there was um, you know I had to cut my phone off um, one of them threatened my son who was you know like eighteen months old at the time it was very ugly all right and. My wife and I had to have these really long discussions about fleeing, basically. Okay, are we going to go, Steve, to your parents in, in Bluefield? All right, also easy to find. Or are we going to go to my parents in, in Northern Virginia? And it was serious. And um, she wanted to pack up the child and go away. But uh, I, I said, I'm, I'm going with you. If you do in the end, um, there were a few very, very good, very, very kind colleagues who gave us a place to hang out, let's say, when we didn't feel like being in the house. But I would walk onto campus on that Monday or Tuesday, and you could just feel the entire fucking place stopping and staring at you, right? Like, do you, it, the, the fact that it was such a, and then just to hear the university say, this, this guy is not one of us, you know, uh, what he did was terrible, blah, 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 it was just, I, I, I can't, I can't, all of this is to say, all right, that 
I'm absolutely not over, you know, those uh, supposed faculty mentors who, who I hope are watching today. I really do. You know, who told me, sorry, I can't help you or you're on your own on this. They literally told me that, right? Who just ignored me, who ran into their offices and shut their doors when I walked by. I mean, you know, it was just an ugly, ugly time in my life. And so that could have only been possible under certain conditions. And one of those conditions being that everybody at least tacitly recognized that we're dealing with uh, extremely mean-spirited administrators and legislature, legislators and, and donors and, and everybody else. It also was a tacit acknowledgement that the military is running the campus in the end, right? That, that, um, that you don't fuck with the ROTC program because the ROTC program is too slow. I got no problem with the ROTC program. I'm just saying that, that it had an, has probably an inordinate amount of power, right? Compared to, to faculty, graduate students, other formations. And I don't know that that, that should be the case at uh, a place of higher education. And it also said that nobody or very few people had a sense of responsibility and obligation towards one another. That if somebody needs a meal or a roof over their head, right? Or, or whatever, if somebody's in distress that you don't run into your office and shut the door. I apologize for going on and on about this, but this is me trying my best to answer uh, the Professor Gill's question in as intimate way as, as possible, that it's, it struck me more than anything, just how disconnected we were, how little we, we felt responsible for one another. And these were feelings that I guess I'd always sensed, but they, they came to the forefront there. And it was extremely hard making it to, to the end of the year, you know, knowing what, what I knew. I just quit, I just quit doing everything. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to your fucking department meeting. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to the committee meeting. I'm not going on any committee at all, right? You know, and so it, it was just, it was entirely indicative of a campus culture that is ready-made to be divided and exploited by management with an absolute ease of effort. And I would hope that not just at Virginia Tech, at any campus, that that kind of, of <coughs> disunity exists that the, the sense of stewardship that we are supposed to have for one another can come into play, you know, in a moment of crisis, no matter who that affects. And I think nothing got me over those, those negative feelings um, until, you know, I, I heard about what, what the graduate students were doing and, you know, all the important work that, because I, that to me, it, it was, changing it's changing the place right from an inhuman geography into a human geography into a place where you can be and feel right? and 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 maybe even live and and as so long as as we're thinking uh, as uh, as one another not just as colleagues but as as stewards of each other's pain and stewards of 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 each other's um compassion and as comrades for one another politically, that, that we're fighting the same fight, that we have the same set of, of enemies, then, um, then, then the, the, the possibilities are endless. Right? But this needed to happen for those possibilities to even come into existence at, at a place like Virginia Tech. And as somebody who grew up in the shadow of the campus, I'm, I'm extremely pleased that it, it happened because the place is not completely irredeemable. Um, it is 7 p.m. and I want to be respectful of your time and I can't think of a better note to end on than that last line. Um, it's, about as, it's about as optimistic as we're going to get. So I'd like to, to uh, thank once again my team uh, without whom this year would not have been possible and to, to whom the graduate students and really this university owe an immense debt. Uh, I'd like to thank all the people who showed up to this talk tonight. Um, we really appreciate it and we're going to continue to share it out widely because a lot of people need to hear it. Um, and especially to our keynote speaker, 
uh, Steven Salada, who delivered. And I could not be happier and just resonated so strongly with the work that we've been doing and has been too kind. Um, truly, uh, we needed this desperately. And thank you so much for everything that you said. Um, and with that, I hope everybody has a lovely rest of their evening. Thank you, everybody. And uh, if you want to, to keep on talking, um, feel free to email me. Honestly, the best way to get in touch with me is find my Twitter and DM me and I'll give you my email address and we can, <laughs> we can continue what, what, whatever conversation that, that you want to continue. And, and thanks for spending the past few hours with me. It was a pleasure. <laughs>